Oil response efforts have a dismal record of containing and recovering the oil. At best, they get 10%. More likely, they get 1% of the oil back. Because the response teams can't recover a lot of the oil, they're left with a bunch of impossible decisions. And the use of dispersants is an example of one of those impossible decisions. Very little research has gone into researching whether or not dispersants keep oil off the coast. And if it doesn't, the worst case scenario is that you've put a lot of dangerous chemicals into the water and you've distributed the harm to three environments, the coastal zone, the water column, and the bottom. The oil in the coastal zone is basically the ring around the bathtub. And most of the oil right now, especially with the heavy use of dispersants, is in the water. It's in the open ocean. And that matters because the upper layer of water is where all the action is. So right now, we have sea turtles swimming through the muck and seabirds floating through the oil and whales and porpoises surfacing and breathing in the fumes. So what are the long-term impacts of oil spills? We learned a lot from the Exxon Valdez um, spill in the research in the ensuing decades. In fact, it revolutionized our understanding. What we found is that a lot of the oil remains in the environment. Some 2% of it is still in the beaches in Prince William Sound, leaching toxic effects out. Every time it rains, there's an oil spill. We're all really caught up in the very real drama of this oil spill right now, but I think it's important to take a broader view and pan out and look at some of the other threats to the Gulf of Mexico. We're trying to extract oil, we're trying to get as much fish and food out of it as we possibly can, and we're using it to dilute our agricultural pollution. We need to take the cumulative impacts of all these industries into consideration, and we need to prioritize ocean health. We need a national ocean policy.